welcome to this session. Uh, thanks for coming. I've been looking forward to it since I was in the equivalent session yesterday, which I thought was just a, a wonderfully engaging conversation. So I'm hoping we can carry on in the same vein. Uh, my name's John Ross. I'm um, Asia Pacific Editor with Times Higher Education. And we have a, a very, very distinguished panel here beside me. I won't um, take up our precious time reading their, their CVs. You can do that, obviously, yourselves in the program. But I will say the CVs are extremely impressive. And um, to my immediate left, we have Sarah Springman, who's the rector of Continental Europe's top university, uh, ETH Zurich. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> and next we have, and I'm going to attempt this, the pronunciation, Hethi Fakeng, um, who's the vice chancellor of Africa's top university, the University of Cape Town. And it's my full intention to spend this entire presentation sucking up to her in the, in the hopes of, um, of getting an invitation to Cape Town. So thank you very much for coming. Well, he's being open and honest anyway. <laughs> and, um, You're all invited. <laughs> oh, that's not fair. And I was trying so hard. Um, ben Nelson is sitting next, um, the founder and chief executive officer of the Minerva Project. Absolutely. Last but not least, Mariana Sutarinen, um, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the uh, University of Helsinki Centre for Continuing Education. Kitos for coming here. <laughs> we're, we're going to start off with a very brief presentation from, from each of the, um, of the panellists, um, starting off with Sarah. Thank you very much, John. Well, I, I'm allowed to show you a slide, I hope. So if I got to move on a bit, there we go. Uh, and since you're coming here next year, uh, in case you didn't know, um, this is Eteha. Uh, that's our lake. That's where I go rowing in the morning. Uh, the campus is over here downtown, and this is our modern campus, just to show you that, just to orient you a bit. Now, who recognized the picture? And Ben, you're not allowed to say anything, <laughs> all right? Who's, who's the picture? OK, if I give you a hint, hint here, who can read that? OK, uh, read that. What I'm saying with this is, that continuing education is not new. It's been around now for uh, a jolly long time, for 200 years and more. And they struggled then, just like we struggle now. So if we think that the kids today who are graduating are going to be working for 50 years after they graduate and probably not properly retiring, there is a role that we have to take on board to be able to retrain them. So we have just, I just want to show you what we've done recently to say we've formed a school of continuing education. We've split it into four different areas. And I can tell you this was quite interesting. Um, they're mainly the CAS, the, the, the certificate, the diplomas, and the masters of advanced sciences. There are other shorter, much shorter courses. And we're going to hear from that, I'm quite sure, from Ben, the clever ways in which they're in, engaging. And what I want to show you, this is the date when I became rector here. It was the 1st of 2015. And we realize it's really very important to bring on board new programs that's cybersecurity, for example. We've got a new MAS in mediation to try and help uh, countries around the world develop mediators who can help to try and solve the problems with it, et cetera, all those sort of things. So you can see here that next year will be more than double uh, the number of courses we had before. So this is an area of major focus for us, and we're very much looking forward to hearing about clever other ways to diversify into, um, into uh, continuing education. And one of our alumni um, and one of our alumni uh, <laughs> on the other side. Thank you very much, everybody. I pass that on. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, that was it. There we go. Back to you. Kathy? Thank you. So I'm, I'm on day number 88 in the job as president of UCT. So, so you're, getting, you're getting fresh voice here. And, and for us, um, preparing our students and our institution for a tech-driven tech future, we have to consider our context. Context matters. Because the future that they're going to be in is not only about technology, it's about where they are at. So what's happening in our, in, our, in our university is that we recruit mainly students from working class backgrounds, about 30% of our students. And of course, the country has got about 35% unemployment. Um, and so we, we've got social, socioeconomic problems in the country, and we've got to consider what it means to graduate from our university and how prepared will the students be for a future that might be in, 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 you know, in terms of socioeconomic terms being the same way, but also technology having advanced. 
So when students come into our university, we've, we've introduced a laptop project. All the working class students who are on financial aid get a laptop and all the software that they need for the programs that they're, that they're registered in is loaded on their laptop. We record all the, all the lectures for them to, be, to have access to the lectures on their laptops 24 seven. We've also um, set up centers in communities around the university. We, we've got a, a solution space in Philippi, one of the townships in the, in the Western Cape, where we work with young people, where we get our, our, our students, work with young people in the community, and work with, with uh, corporates in the city to, for startups, to explore ideas, to collaborate in that space. And, and we've got another center, we call it the Better Center, where we introduce our students to so, uh, um, um, entrepreneurship um, and, 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 and innovation, social innovation, so that our view is that when students get out of the university, they should not only come out with a degree, but they should come out with the skills and attitudes that enable them to, 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 um, to survive in a tech-driven future. And part of these centers that we've set up and the resources, the technological resources that we give to them is to make sure that they're prepared for that because we, it's not clear what that future will mean in a context such as ours. So it's better for us rather than to, to just make programs available online, which we do, uh, rather than just do that, is also to prepare, to have them have the skills to be able to cope in that environment. And that's why we've set up centers such as the, the solution space in, in, in Philippi, um, uh, the Better Center, as well as the D School, uh, which is a, 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 a design thinking school, uh, the only one that we have on the continent. Thanks for that. And, and Ben, can you give us a brief introduction to Minerva Project? Uh, sure. So uh, Minerva is a, a, a completely reimagined university system. Uh, we, we've built and launched uh, what is today the most selective university in the Western world. Um, we have our first graduating class this coming May, and even before we graduated our first set of bachelor's degree students, last year we had more applicants than Georgetown, Dartmouth, or MIT, who I believe have been around for a while, um, and um, have presented a, a, a pretty radically different approach to education, which I think is particularly relevant for continuing education because so much of what's necessary for educational institutions to do in the early parts of education is preparing students to be able to learn for the rest of their lives. And unfortunately, almost all of higher education or, uh, over the past several decades, and some going back several centuries, has really been focused on providing a particular subject matter of instruction. Uh, you know, many countries' systems have uh, uh, degree programs that really are only one field, and that is all that you learn, really. And unfortunately, the human brain is not very good at abstracting generalizable skills by learning subject matter-driven material. Um, and even in countries like the United States that th theoretically provide a broader set of opportunities to take courses, the courses are really, again, subject-driven as opposed to thematically driven. And so when it comes time for uh, people to change careers or change jobs, they oftentimes do find a lot of difficulty in making those transitions. Whereas if you provide some of these core elements uh, that, are, that can stay with you for the rest of your life, in theory, you should be able to make those transitions much, much more easily. Um, and the level of continuing education that you would need would be much more diminished. Mm. Thanks very much. And Mariana, Helsinki perspective? Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, it's an honor and privilege to share the talks with, uh, with all of you and with your audience. Um, yes, I'm from the Center for Continuing Education from the University of Helsinki. And uh, as um, Sarah say, said, uh, we have uh, the history over five decades to, to offer continuing education. But as a business unit, we have worked um, about two years now. So um, work life calls for collaborative knowledge creation sharing. And there is a need of change of attitude and mindset of the research universities in general, in terms of using new learning environments and tools and sharing knowledge, that for sure. Uh, 
surrounding environment as well as degree or, and lifelong learning students are increasingly forcing the universities to come here to them to be more flexible. And I have an interesting, um, interesting um, findings over here. It's the, from the International Data Cor Corporation from this year. <coughs> Um, and it's their finding is that 25% uh, of institutions are about to start on digital transformation, but 75% had no clear plans for dig digital tra transformation or understood the impact it would have their organization. And that's the fact, and it's a little bit, I'm the business lady, that's why uh, I, I can be a little bit revenue mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's something that, because we are taking care of the transnational education in the University of Helsinki, it's, it's very much demand that we have online courses, but it's not only the platform and the technical sources, it's, it's the content. How do you build your online courses? That they are motivated, inspired, and you are uh, feeling that you are part of so, someone meaningful. We have a new generation, and we have to follow. They are our kings. They are our customers, students and adult students. Thank, thanks so much for that. Look, I, I'd like to this, I'd like this conversation to be as interactive as possible. So if anybody has a question or a comment at any time, please raise your hand and wave it around until the stupid chair here notices it. Mm -hmm. um, but look, if, if we could take up on what you're saying uh, on, on digital and on online education, as a journalist, I'm, I'm based in Australia, it seems to me that digital, digital approaches to education almost offer the best and the worst. You have these yes. wonderfully cultivated, blended learning approaches which involve a lot of thought, often a, a lot of expense, and can have fantastic results in terms of, um, in, in terms of teaching and learning. But at the very opposite spectrum, and we've seen a lot of it in Australia, you have this very... Uh, it's um, cynical, tick and flick, um, education, uh, I hesitate to use the word, it's, it's, it's particularly been provided in the training sector, it's about making money, it's about, um, you know, provide, it's credentialism, providing, providing bits of paper, but there's no intent even to, to help people learn anything. So how do we harness this wonderful promise of digital and online education and make sure we get the first and not the second. Does anybody want to take that one up? Well, I, I think we, we have some, some understanding of this. Um, we, at Minerva, even though we're a residential program, 100% of our courses are delivered online. Uh, so even though all of our students live together, uh, we, we could just have them go into a room. We don't allow for that interaction because offline interaction is fundamentally limited. The, in what you can do compared to what we've done in the live video uh, type of environment that we put together. Now, why is that? I, I find that oftentimes the conversations around uh, technology and education are misguided um, because they, they think of a thing such as offline education, which doesn't exist, it's a fiction, and such a thing as online education, which also doesn't exist and is a fiction, right? One can deliver a lecture. Right? You can deliver a lecture in real time in front of an audience of people. You can record that same lecture and also deliver it. The value of electricity being introduced into a lecture format is that you can pause and rewind. Automatically, it's better. Right? Automatically, by definition. Right? And so, same thing with a seminar. Right? You can have a seminar with you know, 10 people in a room, or you can have a seminar with 10 people with live video. Yet in the live video environment, let's say that you can track the amount of time each student has talked so that the professor can very easily know who to call on next. By definition, it's better. Mm -hmm. And so less than, less than thinking about the advantages or disadvantages of this thing thought of as amorphous education technology, much better approach is to say, what are the ideal environments that we could imagine education needing. Mm. And then what kinds of technologies can we bring to pair, bear to enable that educational environment to occur where it cannot occur offline? Mm. 
Yeah, I, I thought not. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't support that more. I think it's a, a wonderful answer. One of the things that, that Eric Mazur, who's... Uh, you know, a, a very famous Minerva Prize winner. I think yeah. he's the sole Minerva she is Prize a, Yeah, he is the only one. Uh, we, we basically, uh, the, uh, the Edan no. Foundation took it over. Okay, anyway, <laughs> all right. But anyway, Eric Mazor, famous Eric Mazor from, from Harvard. And he always says, mm. asset, how you assess people controls how you learn. And so we've listened to that, and we've now developed in a massive push on online examinations. What does that mean? Does it mean it's tick box multi ch mul multiple choice? Well, to a small degree. But what it means is trying to set up authentic examinations. So if you're trying to find out if somebody's learned how to program, what do they have? They have a six hour examination where there's no, no real time limit. They can nip off and go to the loo and do whatever. And they can incrementally improve their, uh, their programming to, to actually be able to produce uh, a really good effort to demonstrate they have learned how to program in whatever language it is. And so we're ramping up our, uh, our opportunities for online examinations. I think we're about uh, 30,000, we have 80,000 examination units a year. 30,000 is the current goal. We're almost there and we'll get up to about half. Some of those exams are oral ones, which is a damn good way of examining, by the way, for those who haven't Absolutely. tried it, really interesting. Um, and, and, and then some written exams as well. And I think that's an important thing to take away as well when we're talking about technology. Mm. Yeah. But it's also why we put our courses online. I mean, I, I hear you the question about quality, mm. but, but, but there's good reasons why we put them online. But the other thing is that sometimes you don't have a choice. Students will, will take your materials online, mm. even if you don't want to, because yeah. they are in class and they're recording anyway. Yeah. So we, we have found that our students were doing that and they were doing voice recording. Um, and many of them would do that because mm -hmm. um, we've got an international campus. Mm -hmm. Many lecturers have different accents and students yes. from low socioeconomic class struggle with the I'm accents. I'm doing it at the moment. And so they would <laughs> record and, and listen in class. So we, that's why we fitted our lecture rooms with cameras to be able to give them an opportunity to get the quality lectures that they get live to access them anytime online. But in addition to that, we've got MOOCs. We've got award-winning yeah. MOOCs. Yep. Um, and those, of course, are not, are not necessarily part of the curriculum. And anyone, whether mm. they are UCT students or not, can access them. Uh, but, and there's levels, of course. You can, you can access the free part of the MOOC. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and in my view, that's, that's continuing education, of course. Yeah. Because you choose it. You choose this MOOC because you want it. Um, and, and if you want to get deeper in that, in that content, you can, you can go to the next level and, and that's when you pay. But, but, and I think those, um, for the MOOCs, um, the, the, there's a quality assurance process that, that we go through that, that, that and, and so we, we, we are comfortable with the MOOCs that, we've put, that we, we have. Uh, and of course, the fact that many of them have won awards, international awards, says mm -hmm. a lot about them. Yeah. So obviously you see um, online or, or digital as, as a very, very useful tool you know, for, for continuing your learning, privilege. yes. Yeah, in, in my view, it's, 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 one, it's one part of it. I mean, I think continuing education, what enables it, it's, 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 it's the skills that you learn, what you, what you learn about learning that allows you, after, get, after graduation, to mm. continue learning, to you know, to know what is it that you, to even be able as a graduate or as a, as a mature student, to be able to assess yeah. um, uh, what's what's chaff, what's what's second grade, and what's first grade, yeah. and what I can go for, and what's what not. Look, at, oh, please, Mariana. There are two interesting <coughs> points um, about the University of Helsinki a digitalization project, which is going on and which is ending, not ever, ever, never, but uh, it's starting, and they have a sort of called uh, the digital leap in education project, and it means the digital leap is tied to the management of degree programs, the development of uh, facilities and communications, and the openness of teaching, it, which is very interesting is that the master thesis will be digitally monitored. And also the digital assessment, assessment, assessment model based on self-assessment will be developed for large-scale courses. But this is the university. It's, mm. a, it's a, different thing in, in, in perhaps in, in, in the yeah. continuing education. But this is very interesting that, that the students are active. Yeah. Just a quick comment. We have some students coming to study an international sort of uh, administration 
course. They travel all around the world. They come for two weeks, and they do online material at home to prepare. And then they come and they fly, but they only come in once. Uh, so it reduces, again, the amount of CO2. But they have that really precious face-to-face -face meeting with their peers and also the, uh, the lecturers. I think that's an important opportunity for us to use, again, what there was the best of all, um, all systems. Yeah, look, I hear everything you're saying about these wonderful opportunities, <laughs> but my, um, my concerns persist, and I'll, I'll explain why. I've discovered as a journalist that governments aren't terribly fond of handing a lot of money out. Um, this is an amazing uh, revelation <laughs> to me. <I'm> and <laughs> boy. There, there are some sectors they like to do that for. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and so they automatically zero in on online education as a way of cutting money, uh, or cutting costs. And unscrupulous people seize on, I'm, I'm talking very much about the, the experience of things I've reported on in my native country, Australia. Um, so you, you'll have unscrupulous com uh, companies seizing on very poorly shaped um, settings, uh, funding settings, to provide rock bottom services and undermining the, um, the, the offering of all the the people on the opposite end of the spectrum, like yourselves, and that's why I'm concerned about it. How do we how do we stop the funding mechanisms from encouraging a race to the bottom? So, uh, I'll give you my, my so in the United States we have a, a, a pretty severe and similar problem, uh, and unfortunately the problem is the doing of the incumbent universities, uh, American universities especially especially the elite universities, will go out of their way to veto any attempt to measure educational outcomes. Mm. Um, you know, when, when the regional accreditors have meetings and they, they, the accreditation requirements say you actually have to track outcomes and things like that, um, it is in our region, which is in, in California, Hawaii, and Guam, it is the elite universities that veto it. Let's say, under no circumstances can you measure the magic that occurs in our institution. And because of that, actors that do not wind up providing uh, a, a good education um, can't be held to account. Mm. And so the, the, the problem is that it, it manifests itself in a striking way in the for-profit sector because they very publicly make an enormous amount of money. But you have nonprofit actors that have single-digit six-year graduation rates, mm -hmm. yet they still are, uh, are enabled to take money from the federal government, money from unsuspecting students, and not deliver them even a low standard uh, education. And so I think that the fix has to be sector-wide. It cannot be, oh, you know, you have bad actors here and bad actors there, but those bad actors are visible, so let's focus on something over here, which has been tried and also failed. Yeah. Um, it has to be um, standards that are applied to the university sector more broadly. Yeah. I can hear academics shouting, what about academic freedom? Yeah. Who are you to <laughs> come and check out what we're doing? Yeah. Who are you to say what we're not, what, what, you know, what we're doing is not good quality or not? But I agree with you that, that the, there's lots of material online that perhaps shouldn't even be. Um, um, and perhaps that should be the challenge for, for higher education in general. I mean, we, because we are public institutions and we are set up for this business, I mean, somehow I feel like we've got much bigger responsibility to, for quality assurance to make sure that what we offer is, is high quality. Mm. Um, but it's usually the players outside the system who, who are doing it for other reasons that, yeah. um, that, that perhaps, um, throw doubts at what we do as well. Yeah. Mariana? I, I was just say, saying that um, um, we have to ask from them who are using these services. So students and, and, and adult, adults and so on, they know very well how, how good are the, the yeah. online courses. So I think it's very simple. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I think value for money is, is part of it. We, we talk a lot about, the, or I talk a lot about the delta. So you come in and then you leave the program. What's the delta that you get from that program? And I think for continuing education, which might be short and sharp or a bit extended, it's, I look at it as a kind of a, a sort of a rocket boost in the middle of your, your career. You're going along on a path, and all of a sudden you look around and say, oh, 
I, I want to do something different. So you sort of boost yourself up into a new, into a new um, satellite, satellite path. And, and that's important. And I think that uh, the graduates that go out into the market afterwards, they're really important um, because they add to your reputation. Um, also, they are the best, um, the best sellers of what they've experienced if it's mm -hmm. been good. And although continuing education at the moment is not properly accredited in the sense of the word, like our, our, our whole system and the bachelor and the master, and we will be going through an accreditation process in 2020, um, I think there is more thinking now about quality assessment in continuing education than there was before. And this is certainly something we'll be working on um, going forward. And I think we constantly have to ask the question critically, are we doing the right thing? We ask our our, our graduates, how would you have done it better, uh, and all of those things. And I think th they're the people who will go out and, and spread the, and if you want the cheap thing, fine, but that's not gonna give you the same rocket boost that yeah. you would get from a, pro an institution that is doing it, uh, whether, whether it's an old traditional one or a modern one, doing it, doing it right, doing the right thing. Mm. Before we move on from this whole area of online, the online space and quality assurance and everything, I'm just wondering if anybody on the floor has some comments or, or questions, please. Hi, I'm Karen Singh from the University of the West Indies. Uh, two questions related to the conversation thus far. The first is, momentum is clearly on the side from a growth perspective on continuing education versus the traditional education. And, uh, okay. um, are you hearing me now? Yeah. <laughs> I was hearing you before, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even better now. <laughs> They're probably recording it. Yes, they are. <laughs> check, check. And so um, the first question is, does the panel envisage um, a medium-term future where continuing education becomes the norm rather than the traditional three, four-year undergraduate degree type uh, situation? We're moving into the world of micro-credentialing and careers changing every three to six years and whatnot, right? And the second question is a lot of the conversation thus far was on the technological side of continuing education, but I've heard very little about the content. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating to me that we come to these conferences and hear universities talking about technology as a mechanism for delivery, right? It's, it's not just that. Of course, then it can create opportunities for more deep engagement and more substantial engagement, but taking old content, taking the narrow singular content and putting it through technology doesn't make it more effective. So where do we see, uh, from a continuing education perspective, content going? What types of education are, are going to be pushed out? Well, in fairness, I think we've just started this conversation, so we haven't covered all the bases yet, but does anybody in the panel want to address either of those questions? I could answer the one, one of the questions uh, a bit. Uh, it's, it's about the, the learning experience and the learning content. It has to be the sort of combination of online tools and, uh, and traditional uh, classroom methods that both are needing. And, uh, and I think that uh, we can uh, uh, implement only online learnings and trainings. There are both uh, old-fashioned classroom and, and uh, spoken head still uh, available, but in future, it's, it's a sort of combination of, of, uh, of, of these, these two things, I guess. Sarah. I'll, I'll give you an answer to both of your questions sort of in one, if you like. So normally what we say is to come on the continuing education, you need to have a master's level degree, because we assume there is a, a background, and it can be a master's degree in something and then go and do something else. So we have a, a program on, uh, on, on uh, cybersecurity and, uh, and data, data science, and we have the social science side of it, and we have the, the technical side of it, and one is a, a, deeper, uh, a deeper dive for people who come from that background, but because so many people have been learning and have done quite well at the bachelor level, we let them in at, at, a, at a bachelor level. Um, and whereas for the sort of the broader programs, generally we require a master, so it's a little bit hard. We do have the Einstein clause, and the Einstein clause says if you can prove you're absolutely jolly brilliant, uh, you, can come and, you can come and do it anyway. But I don't see, but what I do see is the system of um, bachelor and master as a consecutive changing. I, I can see that people come to do a bachelor where they get a solid foundation in maths and natural sciences if you're in the, the STEM area. Maths and natural sciences and the, the focused uh, technical principles theories uh, and all of those things to, that, that give you the base 
and then you go away and you work for a little bit, and then you come back and you might do continuing education, or you might do a master's, or you might do what... I can see it being a much more fluid... Side. You go away and you find a company, and then you come back. At the moment, we're a bit rigid, um, and the, the, the boundaries are getting a little bit frayed at the moment. We still have a maximum limit for us of five years on our bachelor and, and, and three and a half years or whatever it is on, on certain masters. So they, they've got twice the amount of time to do it if they want to. But it, I, I think those things will change as well in the future. I think for, for us, I mean, you, you asked about uh, whether continuing education will become the norm mm -hmm. and the traditional dis university will disappear. And I think for us um, in the continent, we have a problem of the, the fact that we can't accommodate all the students who qualify to come into university. So more and more, we, we struggle with that. Um, and so, so the growing number of students who are, for example, younger students who are going into um, open distance learning institutions is growing. Um, we at UCT have a policy that says you cannot, uh, there's no way an undergraduate student can graduate having studied everything online. They have to be on campus. And we value that. That is important for us, that learning, uh, this part of learning that they have to interact with, with, with other students and they have to be on campus. And, 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 and in some courses, actually, they even, even though we record, in some, some modules, they have to be in class. Um, and and an ex a good example is a philosophy. It's philosophy one, for example, where they have to learn argumentation. That it's important that they're there and they engage face to face and, and, and they learn all about that. So, so there's some of those things that we put in place. But does the future, does it mean the future will always be that way? I'm not sure. It may be different. I mean, with diploma programs, it is possible. Short learning programs for my university, you can do it online and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the future might be different. The second thing you asked was about um, um, uh, you saying we're talking more about the technology and not the content. I mean, my, my view is that um, online education um, challenges you to think about how you teach and how you assess. I mean, and any introduction of technology in the classroom does that. Uh, I'm a mathematics major, and I can tell you how it happens in mathematics even with a calculator. The minute scientific calculators came into class, uh, you had to rethink teaching and assessment. Scientific calculators changed. They, you know, you, uh, students could do, you, the graphing calculators came in. You can't ask the questions in the same way. You can't teach. Uh, the, in the same way, you've got to think teach, teaching differently, you've got to think, rethink assessment. And, and in the same way um, uh, with, with online education, you've got to rethink um, uh, what you teach and how you teach it and how you assess it. Uh, because it's not, it, it's not going to be just the same as, as just um, if the students are in class. So, um, and and we, we, we think about those things. That's why in each module there's always a question about um, um, uh, why is it important that students show up in class? Why is it important that we are recording and they can just sit at home? And in some courses, they don't have to, but in some courses, they do have to, and, and there are good reasons why. I, I would actually argue that it, universities are, are quite uh, poorly set up to be successful in continuing education, um, which is a very controversial point of view. Um, but universities, and, and it's related to your, their question about content, the content that's generated by universities is very slow, right? You have uh, uh, professors who, I mean, look, look at computer science, which is a, you know, probably the, the, uh, an easy uh, uh, example, and, and you see so many of these coding boot camps uh, sprouting up, um, simply because you know, university professors are, uh, do their uh, PhD when uh, computer science language X is prevalent, and then uh, uh, they do their uh, early postdoc when uh, Y is prevalent and Z, et cetera. And by the time they're out teaching students and designing, forget what they know, just designing a curriculum, then doing a syllabus, approving it, and then delivering it, those computer science languages are oftentimes in ancient history. And so there are all of these alternative education providers that are popping up, um, hundreds of them, if not thousands, that are stepping into that world because they 
design educational programs with content that is responsive to what the market wants. And they're much better positioned in that process to be able to respond to market needs. And if universities want to compete with that, they have to adopt many of those types of, of approaches. And so content is, uh, is going to be a prime determinant of how prevalent these continuing education programs uh, are within and outside of universities. It also is going to, um, on the reverse, create a lot of pressure on traditional institutions. Um, again, if you look at the, uh, the American market, uh, if you, you ask uh, a, a, a high school student, why do you want to go to college? This is for college going students. Um, over the past several years, and for the first time in history, the primary answer has been to get a job. Mm. And that is now overwhelmingly why student, why 17 year olds, 18 year olds want to go to college. Well, if you think that going to a university for four years and paying a quarter of a million dollars uh, is the right path to get a job, you're crazy. Um, <laughs> because that's not why you should go to university. You should go to university for how it tools you for the rest of your life. And the fact of the matter is, is that some of these continuing education providers are coming into the 18-year-old and saying, pay us a tenth as much as you pay a university, give us 20% of the time that you would give a university, and we'll give you a higher paying job at the end, and they're right. I think um, Ma Mariana has been yeah, done for yeah. a while, but um, then we'll come to Sarah, because she's obviously, obviously yeah. the rank room bot, what hey, she's you. been said. I would <laughs> like to say that continuous education is, is valid, and it, it's, it have to, it's, it's, we have to uh, have it now and in future and all, all, all the time, ever, always. But the limitation at the moment is it's technology. And in, in, in terms of infrastructure in, in some countries, you, you, you can't get the high-speed internet connectivity, or you, don't, you probably ha have an even electrical supply and such kind of things. That are the limitation. But they are improving and improving all the time in very short time. So it's, uh, it's uh, available for, for many nations, uh, let's say, a couple, in a couple of years. So, and the virtual uh, technology is developing all the time. And I would say that in, in 10 years, we have a sort of classroom that we are, if we are from d distance, we can feel and see the emotions of other people. And it's very important when you are uh, dealing with coaching or mentoring or, or feedback processes uh, between face to face, the, the, this virtual uh, classroom. Sarah. I, I completely agree with Ben about the issue of these coding academies. We looked at doing that. And I said, this is ridiculous. They're learning a program that's going to be out of date in five years. This is not ATH. What we want to do is to take our professors who are working at the forefront of research. For example, Scion is the new internet protocol. You heard it here. Um, those guys are teaching on our cybersecurity courses. So you get the research-based professor who is absolutely in the forefront transferring that into, that's the reason to coming to us. So we just started in materials, a sabbatical-based course where people can come and do a, 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 a certificate. They come, stay for two months. They choose what they want to do. They select what it is they need to learn, and they design their own. Otherwise, in content, we have something we call a qualification profile. What do the people need to know at the end? And then you plan the content all the way through so that, um, so that you get, and I completely agree, it's not about the, uh, the, the, the packaging. It's about what, what's in it that is, that is important. Do you, do you think a lot of universities can sort of move at the sort of the rate that you're talking about and which um, Ben seems to think they can't? Um, I think they can, actually. I mean, I showed you the changes. We, okay, so it's, it's, you can say it's slow, but actually for a Swiss university, it's pretty damn <laughs> quick. It's not glacial. We'll come next year and I'll show you about it, you know. Yeah, We're not glacial, are we, Roman? Yeah. No, there yeah. you go. Yeah, their base is uh, very slow, and, uh, but because they focus is on research and applied research, the basic research. So, so they are not very, e are not very eager to, to de develop these kind of courses. Well, if you're, if you're in a developing country like, like us, you've got to do everything. You've got to do the basic research. You've got to do responsive research that attends to the problems of society. 
you've got to do e everything. I mean, yeah. and if you if you if if THC says you're number one in the continent, the expectations go higher. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious to that, to that question. <laughs> How many of you in this room have heard of Trilogy? <laughs> Two. So this is fascinating. Trilogy is the fastest growing education startup in history. Mm -hmm. um, they're about two or three years old. And what they do is they go to universities and they say, you guys are too slow, just admit it. We're going to set up coding boot camps within your university. We're not going to ask for any of your faculty, any of your administration. It's basically a shell. They operate everything, but they just leverage the university's brand. And they are signing these contracts with very prestigious universities in the United States now at something like a rate of one a week. Mm. Um, and these are major long-term contracts. And it is a reaction to, in, in some cases, a lot of universities are just giving up. And they're saying, well, we can't be reactive, so we're just going to license our name and let other people do it, which we have a couple of uh, questions from the floor, I think. Um, uh, well, the probably is a couple behind you. <laughs> There's, we have got a lot of questions from the floor. If you could just put your hand up. Uh, I think starting with this gentleman here. Uh, Alexandre Bloch from the US. Um, we're talking about... Ah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're talking about research universities. Um, so I would like to know what uh, do you ex what do you expect uh, from research in education? Uh, to improve uh, continuing education, what would you, uh, what uh, do you want to focus on, and what would be the, the best uh, added value of research in education? Mm -hmm. yeah. if, if all the universities were to listen to the research, you yeah. know, Eric Mazur is an example. Did his seminal yeah. research on active learning at Harvard more than 20 years ago, <laughs> proved that the same professor with the same content, teaching the same quality of students using active versus passive learning, basically his approach versus the approach of almost all Harvard classes, would improve educational outcomes by 7x, not 7%, 7x, 10 to 70% retention. It's a bigger effect than penicillin is to sugar pills. Right? That research was done at Harvard more than two decades ago. How did Harvard respond? By thanking him very much. <laughs> right? Um, there's been no change in the way almost any university delivers its, its, uh, its courses. They're still overwhelmingly passive. Even seminars are often delivered in passive ways. And so there's an enormous amount that the science of learning can teach us about how to educate, but universities actually have to have an incentive for educational outcomes to do anything about it. Well, there's a very, I mean, we've created a very interesting incentive. We have a, a new award called, and I'm not really generally in favor of massive, yeah. massive awards, but it's interesting, stimulation. We call it the KITE Award, the Key Innovation in Teaching uh, Excellence Award. And the first year, um, there were, I don't know, 20 uh, groups that applied for it. Really very interesting, some really nice project. We had a nice finals, and they presented, and then they got, they got a very nice award. Um, and then two years later, we did it again. This time, 30 projects. Came. And the quality of the projects was, was even better. So they were looking at each other. They were learning from each other. We were raising the profile of teaching within the university, um, which was really, really important. So I think by, it's a sort of, I think it's a push me, pull you. So in creating these new courses that I showed you, these are all created absolutely from scratch. So it means that there is a research core to the background of what they're teaching. And as long as these professors aren't teaching the same thing in 30 years' time, I don't mind. So as long as they, and each time you sort of refresh the ideas you're doing, you use a flipped classroom, you do peers, you do co-creation or whatever it is, and, and, and you use your learning development group to help you uh, with your didactics, it's much more fun, yes. you know? <laughs> and, and, and our young professors come to us, the assistant professors, and I send them off on a little, I encourage them to go on a, a learning to teach a day to house, three and a half days, and they prepare their first courses. And one of our guys was teaching um, a quantum, a quantum uh, engineering to the students in, in, in physics, and he said, I threw away all my old, it's so much more fun doing it this way. <laughs> so if you can get them and you can infect them, it's a sort of an infection process, and you do it from the bottom up. The other ones will, in, in Switzerland at least, we still retire our people. 
Um, so, they, so they go off the top, and so you get, you get the change. And by the way, one thing I did want to say is, not only are we the top-ranked uh, university in continental Europe, we're also the best value for money in the top 11. Because <laughs> <laughs> our students pay 1160 Swiss francs a year, by the way. So it, not only the US model. So we have a negative about the fact, did you know that any student, this is meant to be continuing education, but I'm going to tell you a story <laughs> while I'm here. We, any student who passes the Matura examination in whatever subject can choose to go to whatever university in Switzerland to discover, to study any subject. So you can do a modern languages uh, Matura and you can come and study with us and do mechanical engineering or whatever. We do not choose our students. That's another challenge. So we will never be top of the rankings, but we do have the cheapest fees of the top one. So there you go. It's a, it's a quid pro quo. Sorry, good back on to again. Very good ad. Um, so with this person towards the back who's been waiting for a while. Yeah, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Dune MacDonald, the University of Queensland. I'm interested in micro-credentialing. And um, often it gets associated with continuing education, but increasingly micro-credentials and badges are of interest, certainly in Australia, for undergraduate students. Um, it raises questions about quality assurance and do all badges and credentials need to look alike? And how do you manage that in, in a slightly feral academic environment? So um, any thoughts on the future of micro-credentialing in our universities uh, would be appreciated. I would just say that universities have been issuing micro-credentials for several centuries. Uh, it's called the transcript. Um, no one looks at it. <laughs> Mariana. <laughs> Education is for all. Uh, in our center, it's, it's for all, and it's, 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 we are putting the training courses so that they're very practical, and you can implement those outcomes easily to your work. We haven't we haven't done anything yet in terms of MOOCs and access and bringing people who do well in MOOCs to. But I think MIT is quite expert. Is anybody here from MIT? they've been doing that really quite effectively, running a, a, a MOOC or a, an online course, and then the best people come in and do the, the 30 people face-to-face -face mm. version. I think yeah. that's really interesting, actually, and it's something is worth looking at. Yeah. Does anybody else want to grab micro-credentials before we well, go to well, and, and I, was, I, was, I just wanted to say in, 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 in our country, for example, there's many students who can't go to university who'd access MIT courses online and they won't have the certificate, but they would have the education that comes from it. Yeah. And they would go on because they can't afford. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah. but as long as they can get online and, and access the materials, they would do that. Yeah. We've had a very per patient person yeah. waiting here. Okay. Uh, I have a question for him. Mm. Uh, the Unilever began to admit your first undergraduate uh, student five years ago. So would you please tell, uh, tell us more about the students their achievements, how they are accepted by the job market, and uh, how do you feel about the learning experience? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, just very briefly, I think it's related to, to what I was, was saying before, which is you know, we, we spend uh, an entire year teaching our students various systems of thinking, uh, no subject matter whatsoever. Uh, and then three years as they do their subject matter studies, reinforcing those systems and having them apply them both in expected and unexpected ways, all designed into the curriculum, all tracked, assessed uh, for all four years. And the, the results are you know, what we would expect but are shocking for most people, which is it turns out education actually matters. Um, our students generally, when they go out to do summer internships, now when they're on the job market as they are about to graduate our first class, um, they are receiving opportunities uh, that are generally available to students that are substantially older than they are in other institutions. Uh, you know, we've had uh, first-year students do summer internships that are open only to PhD students. Um, and that is because they learn systematic thinking. And systematic thinking trumps content a hundred times out of a hundred times. Uh, and um, you know, we encourage others to do the same. Sorry, we have a question down here. Yeah. And then you, sir. Thank you. Samuel Kirby from the Swiss Embassy in, in Singapore. Um, there is a difference between to study and to learn. 
right? And when you study, usually you learn, but you don't have to study to learn. Um, and it seems to me we're completely focusing on, on learning here. So um, we're talking about a, a tech-driven future. And we keep hearing that we've got to be more agile, more critical thinking, more lateral thinking. Um, I would say it seems to me that when we have those programs, and, and my social media floated with programs in blockchain, AI, mm -hmm. uh, cybersecurity, and all, they are about absorbing new knowledge, about learning, but not really about studying. And one of the most fundamental missions of universities is actually not to just be focusing on, on the flow of information, uh, but rather on the heritage of knowledge. Um, do you think that is also a threat for your fundamental mission in that case? This, this is a very good comment, thank you. Because, because that's, that's the reality that the people can get facts and knowledge from internet for, for whatever. It's the skills, uh, how we, how we develop, de develop skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, to, to do together things, to be social, and this kind of thing. That is, that is going on in, in our Finnish um, primary and secondary school education. The, the pupils are active to, to to create the critical thinking. The critical thinking is to how to analyze the information you get, the flow of it. Mm. Anybody else want to take that? I mean, I'm, I'm interested, given what, what Ben said about what we teach. I mean, as he was talking, I was thinking, do you teach engineers that way? But, but I'm interested in your, in your answer to that question in particular. Mm. Well, <laughs> um, so, so look, systematic thinking is, um, uh, is relevant no matter what you pursue. I mean, you, so you can be an engineer, you can be a custodian. Um, but if you can actually look at a problem, break it down into its component parts, reassemble those component parts into novel solutions, think about the unintended uh, effects of implementing that solution in an organic system, uh, and how you need to modify the solution in relation to that, and then how to actually communicate that solution to other people so that they can understand it and join your effort to implement it, you can apply that to anything. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that universities will uh, take the mantle and claim that they do this, right? I mean, I don't know of any university that says, we teach our students content. Every university, certainly that I've encountered, says we teach our students how to think critically. But when you actually ask, where in the curriculum do you do this? They say, well, you know, we have a bunch of content and you pick up the critical thinking by accident. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's very, very hard. It doesn't work, right? And we, you know, we, we, um, we spend 32 out of 120 credit hours exclusively teaching systems of thinking. Mm -hmm. And then we spend the remaining credit hours reinforcing it deliberately. Right, with actually an actual taxonomy of 80-some habits of mind and foundational concepts that interleave every single one of our courses in every single subject with assessments that are living, uh, where more than 25% of the grade point average of a student when they graduate assigns strictly, in fact, basically 40% of the grade point average assigns strictly to how well they apply systems of thinking. That is how you actually transform a mind. But that level of cross-disciplinarity and curricular discipline oftentimes runs into questions of, oh, but what about academic freedom? <laughs> what about the professor being able to walk into a class and teach whatever they want? You see, we, 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 do, we do this, we teach this thinking, but it happens in the D school, in a design yeah. thinking school. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily part of the mainstream curriculum. So the students would be in engineering or in whatever faculty, and then they would go into the design school, design yeah. thinking school, mm -hmm. to do that, all that work that you're saying. Yeah. Postgraduate students have a choice whether they want to do that or not. And of course, you see a difference in terms of, because they do that at the beginning, it's offered at the beginning of the year before semester starts, um, and it's free for all students who are UCT students, but non-UCT students have to pay to come in. Mm -hmm. but, but you can see the students who, who go in there when they get to start their, 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 their research projects that, um, um, how it shapes what they do. But, and imagine but, but if you were to expand that, spend even more time on that, and then change the way you deliver all of your other courses to reference back to the tools they learned to actually implement them. Mm. It would really be ingrained in their mind. Yeah. 
Yeah. That really is, is transparent. Sarah, I think you want to write, write a reply, but we're actually running very short no, of time. No, so I'm, I'm fine. I, I'll, I, can, so I think studying and learning can be sometimes a semantic difference because it sort of over, overlaps a bit. And I think if you're yeah. on a technical university, it's different to if you're in a comprehensive um, university on de dealing a lot with humanities and social sciences. But I think studying is important, and sometimes students need to have time for self-reflection. Uh, and so sometimes we need to take stuff out of the curricula so that it is time to, to reflect and, and, and pick up on, um, on some of those ideas. We had another question down towards the back. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Jimmy Volnink. I'm from Stellenbosch in South Africa. And we have the best wines in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so, so, <laughs> so we've been focusing a lot on, on how to deliver uh, you know, uh, uh, ongoing learning and, and and you know we talked about content and talked about critical thinking, but there is another aspect which is for some of the professional areas, which is practical skills, and and you know th there, there are challenges around ongoing education in terms of assessing those competencies. And I just wondered if there might be examples that you know of, uh, you know, that we can learn from in that regard. Yeah. I mean, John, I'm sure you would know that at UCT, our medical students. I mean, uh, um, 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 Faculty of Health Sciences is an interesting case in terms of practical, practical learning. Uh, first of all, you don't qualify to be a medical doctor at UCT if you cannot, if you haven't passed Isiprosa, which is a local language, because all the students are expected to spend significant amount of time in community hospitals or clinics, um, working with the midwives or nurses on the ground. Um, uh, which, in my calculation, and you would know better, that they, 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 they do much longer time in that regard, and we are the only university that actually expects that of our medical graduates, that they are prepared to serve the people on the ground, firstly by being able to speak the language and being exposed to the real context that they're going to be working in when they graduate. Um, and, and, I, and I think for, for us, in, you know, in, in terms of practical education, that's, that's, that would be the approach. But you, you've been in the system. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I was talking about beyond that. So, so you know, once they've graduated, and how, how do we keep them upskilled in some of these practical areas? Yeah. Mm. Does anybody else want to? We will leave, if you have a strong foundation and a taxonomy of practical knowledge, knowledge that you can apply in real world situations. Um, we, in fact, um, many of our students do practica, which is when they go into real world experiences, uh, they apply what they learned in to a job, an internship, a research model, et cetera, and then they actually have to show what pieces of practical knowledge that they've, from their curriculum, they applied into the real world setting. And we try to get them in the habit of, uh, we refer to it as seeing hashtags, because we, we use hashtags to classify every bit of the uh, practical knowledge that they learn. And so when Minerva students walk around the world, they'll see floating hashtags all over, uh, <laughs> because it, it's a different lens of absorbing the world. And the more that you get in the habit of doing that, the more you can connect your formal education to your practical applications. Um, look, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the time allotted for this conversation. I, I prepared about 10 dot points to guide the conversation, <laughs> and we've got through one of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. so look, I, 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 please put your hands together for the panellists for a really engaging Thank you so much. <laughs>